Good day. We're talking about risk reduction in the portfolios in this lecture. And in the previous lecture, we talked about reducing risk. We remember we talked risk is unavoidable. Risk in security investments is there, which we cannot deny. Yes, we can manage it. The larger the number of securities in the portfolios, the lesser the risk. But you cannot completely get a do away with risk. So risk is there. It will not do much about having a lot of uh, companies in the portfolio, but it does help. The question remains, what is an ideal number for a portfolio? How many is a good number? How many is a perfect number to be in a portfolio? It's difficult. It's difficult to give an answer to that because it will all depend on the size of the portfolio. If you were looking at risk reduction in portfolios, we'd talk about randomness and our plan to choose and pick in randomness. Any security will not maybe match with another, maybe a different asset class. The investment characteristics can be changed. Marginal risk reductions can be done. With smaller and smaller, the securities are added. The risk will reduce the more the number of securities are. But a large number of securities is not required for significant risk reduction. Also, international diversification sometimes gives you a good benefit. It is not a question of how much. We need to understand how good are the companies in the portfolio. We need to understand about diversification, whether it's about local companies or international diversification, we must understand. We do understand that as companies will grow in your portfolio, the reduction will reduce and will come in line with the market risk, which would mean you will not be exposed to any uncertain risk more than the average market risk. But then, I'm sure, obviously, since we are not taking too much risk, the returns shall also be marginal and returns shall also be in line with the market risk. But what we do about portfolios is to have a better than average result. So to do that, we need to have better collection of good, uh, good companies in the portfolio, unlike the standard run-of-the-mill portfolio, the standard index composition of the portfolio. So we do understand that we can increase the number of companies and then save ourselves from any sort of untoward risk factor. We call it diversification. More so, Let's talk about Markowitz diversification and where you do not include companies in randomness. It is non-random diversification. And this is an active measurement of the portfolio risk. You actively manage and you look at how you perform while looking at the portfolio risk factor. So you look at the relationships between risk and reward. You also take advantage of expected returns and compare them with the risk of individual companies in an entire portfolio. Remember, we do not look at individual scripts to be out doing uh, the entire portfolio as far as risk is concerned. We do feel that the risk of an individual security will not outweigh the goodness of the entire portfolio. So we can talk about measuring of portfolio risk and it's needed, it's important. It's something like planning, formulating, implementing and evaluating anything you do. And in this case, it's about portfolio. So you look at the individual risk of uh, the companies included in the portfolio and then you make a weighted average. You look at the, the portfolio as a, in totality. You do not look at the portfolio in a single product identification and you use it in proportion to the risk factors of the portfolio completely. Now, we did talk about portfolio risk, we did talk about Markowitz style of diversification and we did talk about looking at the better part of the portfolio in complete unison as one product. We talked about correlation coefficient. We talked about the statistical measure of association being the correlation coefficient. That is the statistical measure of association. And we understood that we needed to see 
how these correlations worked efficiently in the products that had been included in a portfolio. We didn't talk about what a portfolio is. We by now all know what a portfolio is. But for people who would want to brush up on their memories, brush up on your, their understanding of portfolios, portfolios is a, a collection of different diversified products. I'm using the word products. I'm using the word financial products. I'm using the word why, because we're not only talking about stocks. So does diversification pay? Does it? When does diversification pay? It does when you have perfectly correlated securities. Does it do that when you have perfectly correlated securities in positiveness? Well, a risk is a weighted average, and therefore there is no risk reduction. So diversification will not pay if you look at the risk as a weighted average. But zero correlation, what will the result be then? And what will happen if you have a perfectly negative correlated relationship in security? These are the things that we discussed in the previous lecture. But we need to talk about more things um, going ahead. And you will, of course, have to have a look at the uh, books and the notes that have been uh, recommended to you and the, the handouts that have been provided to you to understand this more. So we can look and talk about covariance. We've talked about coefficient correlation. Covariance is actually an absolute measure of association, not limited to numbers between negative 1 and positive 1 or minus 1 and positive 1. Signs interpret the same as correlation and the correlation coefficient. If you remember, we showed you the equation in the previous lecture, the correlation coefficient and covariance are related to each other by way of the equation that we showed you in the last lecture. And if you want to, we can do that again in lecture coming forward. But this is important for you to understand that we must try to measure risk. We must try to evaluate the risk factors and the advantages of taking risk and looking at the risk and reward trade-off so that we know what sort of risk is going to give you what. So how do you go calculate portfolio risk? How do you do that? We talked about encompassing three factors. There were three major factors that we looked at. There were maybe variance. It was covariance and it was portfolio weightage that we talked about. But the goal is, the goal is to get the maximum return from the portfolio to perform in a better way than the rest of the stocks. And for that, we need to have an optimal portfolio, balanced portfolio, maybe blended with growth stocks and uh, value stocks. And then, of course, we, take, we do not take unnecessary risk because we found it doesn't pay to have unnecessary. It is not important to, under, uh, to have risks that are beyond our control because we have proved that risk will definitely not outweigh your returns. So there is no point, there is no need to take unnecessary risk in uh, making a really, really growth a portfolio. So when we're talking about generalizations, we can talk about things that are related to portfolio risk. And we talked about generalizations like the smaller the positive correlation between securities, the better. Also, we understand that covariances calculations grow quickly. As the number of security increases, the importance of covariance relationship increases. The importance of each individual security and the risk attached to them will decrease. Remember, each time we talk about portfolios and each time we talk about individual investments, we're talking about diversification and the factors included in risk, the lesser risk in portfolios, a little more risk in individual investments. So Markowitz full covariance model is important, which requires a covariance between the returns of all securities in the portfolio in order to find out the benefits of the covariance model of Markowitz. So you simplify Markowitz calculations and Markowitz suggests that using an index to which all securities are related simplified. So you need to understand that you have to have a base, you have to have a benchmark, you have to have a model in which you'll be able to correlate all the uh, the empirical data that you can be able to gather and input on a day-to-day -day basis because you need to understand portfolios, valuations have to be done on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, 
We did have a good talking about efficient portfolios. The bottom line always remains what sort of portfolio are we talking about? What sort of a portfolio will give us the best returns? What sort of uh, things have to be included to be understood as an efficient portfolio? What is efficiency? Actually, efficiency is uh, like the smallest portfolio risk for a given level of expected return. You must understand we're trying to minimize risk. We're trying to increase returns or expected returns. Obviously, we've got no such thing as a guarantee of a perfect return. We think we can talk about expected returns. So, the largest expected return for a given level of portfolio may be another option. From the set of all possible portfolio subsets and look at how we can build up an efficient portfolio. Efficient portfolios will give you better returns as compared to risk. Efficient portfolios will have to be actively managed or passively managed will depend on the type of scripts that's been included. So the lowest level of return is important. The lowest level of return sometimes become important for different types of portfolios, but that is not part of a good portfolio. You have to look at the different levels of risk factors the investors are willing to take with your kind of portfolio. So on the outset, you have to describe what sort of a portfolio it is going to be. So you can have a very aggressive portfolio. You can have a mild portfolio will depend again, once I again reiterate on what sort of investors you're going to attract to your portfolio. Because we talk about portfolios being a better way of investments and minimizing risk. This is done in the fact that you need to have a lot of portfolios that are attainable sets and are dominated by efficient sets. There is a global minimum variance portfolio with the smallest risk of the efficient set of portfolios or what is then the efficient set which would be part of efficient frontiers with risk that is global minimum variance portfolio. We talked in few minutes ago about foreign investor in or diversification international portfolios. Because a lot has got to do with the sovereign guarantees, a lot has got to do with the risk factors and the diversification. We looked at different sources of risk, what sort of sources of risk there are. We talked about maybe market risk or maybe interest rate risk or foreign exchange risk or uh, stability risk or company risk or uh, industry risk or sovereign risk. So sometimes Putting in international products in the portfolio also becomes a good idea to build up a better portfolio. This will all depend on the, the magnitude and the market capitalization or the paid up capital in case it's a close-ended fund or the number of investors you have attracted to the mutual fund. Maybe if we get time, we'll talk more on mutual funds in a later lecture. We have talked about mutual funds, but it was important to drop this name uh, into my conversation because portfolios, asset management, mutual funds are all the names of the same game. Because we are talking about diversification, then obviously we're talking about portfolio, obviously we're talking about an asset management uh, product, and then obviously when we're talking about portfolios, we're talking about mutual funds. So if somebody was to invest in a diversified product, uh, the portfolio would be able to give you the best returns depending on what sort of sectoral investments have been done or what sort of a decision has been made onto how aggressive the portfolio will be managed or how aggressively the products in the portfolio will behave. It is important for us to understand that these uh, portfolios are built to diversify. They are built to diversify and minimize risk. Once again, risk is unavoidable. Risk can be managed. And it's not about risk in investments. Risk can be in any uh, investment procedure. So to build up portfolios and to look at the efficient portfolios, to look at the risk factors and to look at the, uh, the reward factors, we need to get down to things uh, which would help us in selecting a portfolio. So then how would we be talking about portfolio selection? What would be a good portfolio? What would be uh, the way to select portfolios? Once again, the key word would be diversification. So diversification is the key to optimal 
risk management. Analysis is required because of the infinite number of portfolios of risky assets. And in the portfolio selection, we look, we should question whether how should investors select the best risky portfolio or how could riskless assets be used in a portfolio. Portfolio selection is also an art and a science because you have not to use the dartboard method. You're not talking about uh, choosing scripts in randomness. We're talking about non-random selection. We're talking about um, really doing asset valuation. We're talking about stock valuation. We're talking about commodity valuation. And then looking at the best possible options that we have. Remember, there are a lot of companies in the stock market. There's a lot of products. There's a lot in the money market. There's a lot in the foreign exchange. But if you were focusing on stock markets or the equity markets, or we would understand we all have to do is maybe select maybe uh, a dozen or two companies to build up the portfolio, depending on what sort of portfolio's returns we are expecting. Now, every time we look at portfolios, we're looking at diversification and we're looking at the risk factors that have to be minimized. So while we're doing that, we're talking about deciding on what sort of a portfolio selection there is to be, and then how do you build up that portfolio? How do you get on with the steps involved in building up a portfolio? So if you're looking at steps in uh, building up a portfolio, we would be talking about using the Markowitz portfolio selection model. And we talked about Markowitz portfolio selection model as being a model that uh, considers non-randomness. It looks at the factors involved in variance, covariance, and the risk reward trade-off that is looked at as the best possible script selecting model. So you look at the optimal combinations in the Markowitz model would be step number one. And then in step number two, you choose a final portfolio based on your preferences, based on what sort of a risky factors you're looking at and what sort of riskless return you're looking at. But of course, returns will be correlated with risk factors but you look at what is best possible return model for you when you look at your preferences. So you can look at step number one, maybe Markowitz model, and then in step number two, you choose the final portfolio from the predetermined decision factors that you look at and you expect, you look at the expected returns, you look at the expected risk factors and the covariance between each security. Because sometimes, if you put up more scripts from the same industry, it's not going to work out as a good diversified portfolio. Why? Because maybe the market leaders in that particular sector will outweigh and outdo and maybe lead good companies to maybe worse return compared to industry independent company being involved in the portfolio. What I mean to tell you is that you cannot put in more than the eggs of the same uh, same bird, meaning industry-specific shares have to be diversified because if you were to be, let's say, talk about uh, the cement or the oil sector, you put in too many cement stocks into the uh, portfolio, you'll maybe have a very average return because if there's something wrong with the industry, what will happen is that you'll be able to look at the industry and then uh, the companies in that sector will probably tend to move in groups in, in the same routine and maybe overlook the potential of their earnings. So sometimes industries have to have minimal exposure in a portfolio and it's always a good idea to have different companies from different industries in the portfolio. Then you would have to look at what sort of, you have to estimate the expected return. If you're looking at portfolio theories, if you're looking at uh, portfolio risk, if you're talking about portfolio selection, we need to understand that optimum is the word. The first key word was diversification. Okay, there's no denying that. But let's add the word optimum to diversification. So optimal diversification takes into account all available information. Remember, we talked about efficient market hypothesis and all other fundamental valuations available to us. So in optimal diversification, we look at all the information available to us, and then we take it into account and all look at the assumptions in portfolio theory. 
we're talking about a single investment period, like one year or two years or three years, we decide that this is a single investment period that we're going to build up the portfolio for and look at the returns on that specific single period. Or we look at the liquid position, meaning the known transaction cost. We look at the liquid position, how long are we going to keep liquid, and then pick and choose the best of the best building up the portfolios. Obviously, the transaction costs will be nil or minimal. Then we look at the preferences. We talked about in portfolio selection, we talked about the Markowitz selection model, and then your final preference on the scripts, because you will be able to identify a lot of scripts, and then you choose which is the best. Preferences based only on the portfolio's expected return and risk. It is important to understand that we have to have a balance between return and risk. And the portfolio th theory will obviously talk about optimal diversification so that you have the best possible returns, keeping in line with reducing risk and then looking at best possible returns for your uh, stakeholders or your investments. But if you were to look at your personal preferences, obviously, you're not talking about biases. We're ta not talking about your um, unquantified and unqualified attachment with a, a particular share or an industry. We are talking about mature, uh, unbiased, rational decisions on what sorts of scripts to be included in a portfolio. So in doing that, it's a good idea to make a benchmark, a benchmark in which you decide what sort of investment period that you're looking at. Other would be maybe putting a benchmark on what sort of a market capitalization or paid up capital you're looking at when you're including companies. So if you're talking about portfolio theories, if you're talking about the Markowitz model and we're looking at the smallest possible uh, risk uh, levels to be seen, we look that the smallest portfolio risk for a given level of expected return will be the best possible way to understand what this is all about. So we can look at the largest expected return for a given level of portfolio as well. And we can look at how to build up these efficient portfolios. Just a, few, a little while ago, we looked at the efficient portfolios and the portfolio theory. While doing that, we're looking at all the system related to smallest and largest. The smallest portfolios or largest portfolios uh, will matter most when you're looking at smallest and largest in reference to number of scripts included in the portfolio. So a smallest portfolio risk for a given level of expected return could be one efficient portfolio. Another could be largest expected return for a given level of portfolio risk. So we're talking about switching over portfolio risk with expected returns. The smallest portfolio risk with largest expected returns or largest expected returns with the level of given portfolio risk. Also from the set of all possible portfolios, we need to find out, we need to only locate and analyze the subset known as the efficient set. Meaning lowest risk for given level of return. We talked about a lot of things in portfolios. Generally, the, the reason we have portfolios is to help out people who don't have acquired knowledge needed for successful venturing into the capital market. We, we need not go into the details of how we can look at risk factors in the capital market because it has been established by now that um, everything comes at a cost. If you're looking at good returns, we're expecting to take some sort of a risk. We're not talking about riskless investment, and we're certainly not talking about taking too much risk. But what we are talking about is taking risk that would be manageable. So there is a certain amount of manageability in risk with which we can optimize our returns once we have had the best efficient portfolio. So in efficient portfolios, we need to understand once again, the lowest risk for given level of return. 
when we're talking about given levels of returns, we're talking about some expectations. Obviously, we're talking about returns. Just to help you out, I'll want you to focus on your screens and have a look at the picture, the diagram the, uh, in front of you that shows you the efficient frontier or the efficient set. And if you look carefully, that's the curved line from A to B. And the global minimum variance portfolio, which is represented by point A. Have a look at the A the, on the, the, the curved line, the blue line, and then you will be able to look at the global minimum variance portfolio represented by point A. And if you look at the entire curve or the part curve from A to B, you'll be able to look at the efficient frontier or efficient set. So when we're talking about efficient portfolios, it will be important for us you to be able to gauge or um, visualize what are going to be efficient portfolios returns to all the efforts that have been made in selecting a portfolio. We had uh, referred to Markowitz as being one of the ways to, you know, include in the selection process. But eventually, it's going to be personal preferences once you have a limit or you have a detail of scripts with you. Obviously, they're going to be more than the required number in the portfolio. And then you can use the personal preferences to the fine tune the portfolio and take a decision on what is going to be the final inclusion of the uh, scripts or the stocks into the portfolio. So while we're talking about, we use the word optimal. While we're talking about diversification, I added up the word an optimal diversification because we try to get the best out of the best. Selecting an optimal portfolio of risky assets, obviously risky assets. What are assets? We talked about assets being of uh, something that you own. And obviously, if you're adding word risky, it would be something risky that you own. Risky assets right now we could ascertain as being stock. So if you're looking at selecting an optimal portfolio of risky assets, we could be talking about assumptions or assume investors are risk averse. If you look at this factor that uh, the investors are risk averse, you assume that risk, risk averseness is there in investors, then indifference curves help select from efficient sets. The indifference curves help us do that, uh, being selected from different efficient sets to find out the optimal portfolio of risky assets. Also, there is a description of preferences for risk and return. You need to understand what sort of risk you're willing to take. You need to understand what sort of risk you're going to let people look at when they're going to get into the portfolios you've chosen for them on personal preferences. Of course, keeping in mind the Markowitz model as well. So portfolio combinations which are equally desirable. That is one another factor that you have to decide on while we're talking about selecting an optimal portfolio of risky assets. Now, we also need to understand that the greater slope implies greater risk and uh, greater risk aversion as well. So slopes will help you look at the way you want to and find out what level of risk there is. In trying to find out the best possible way of optimal uh, portfolio of risky assets, we always want to understand that there is a return that is desirable. What is a desirable return? What would you understand by the word desirable? A desirable word would be meaning different for different people because everybody has a different level of tolerance. Everybody has a different level of patience. Everybody has a different level of required expected return. And there is a level of what everybody is going to look at while we're talking about risk returns trade off. So we need to be understand while I'm still on the topic of trying to select an optimal portfolio of risky assets, we need to understand the Markowitz portfolio selection model. I mean, we need to understand because this is the best guideline we can get in portfolio selection. Markowitz portfolio selection model has to be looked at and this generates a frontier of efficient portfolios, which are equally good. This model helps us do that. 
this model helps us generate a, a frontier of efficient portfolios which are equally good. We're talking about a balanced portfolio of risky assets. We're talking about optimal portfolios of these risky assets. So what a Markowitz model does is, or when we're talking about selection, what it does not help us in is it does not address the issue of riskless borrowing. It does not address the issue of riskless lending. In fact, it does not uh, do well on the issuing of riskless borrowing or lending. That is not the domain of Markowitz. It doesn't do well. Every model or every theory has its own parameters, node frontiers, beyond which probably it will be unable or will be ineffective. So, uh, in case of the Markowitz portfolio selection model, um, it does not address the issue of riskless lending or borrowing. So, different investors will estimate the efficient frontier differently. Since these are all individuals, they have their own ways of assessing risk and return. They have their own ways of estimating the efficient frontier, and they'll do it differently, which would mean there is an element of uncertainty in application. Now, the thing is, it is very difficult to have a perfect, perfect model. You may have an imperfectly perfect model or a perfectly imperfect model, but you cannot have a foolproof system. If you have a foolproof system, you let me know because we haven't been able to find foolproof system. Why? Because of variations, because of variability, and because of uncertainties and about future. We are talking about the future. Once again, future is unobservable. Since future is unobservable and it will come in its own way, how do you think there is a possibility that we'll be able to reign in future? That's not possible. So when it's the, uh, not possible, how do you think returns can be perfected? It will be expected. It will be optimal. Optimal risk return trade-off. But the element of uncertainty cannot be ruled out. But if you were to talk about the single index model, that will probably help us in relating returns on each security to the returns on a common index simple very basic very simple and you are able to relate one product with a benchmark so if you look at the equation and it is important for you to look at the equation because it will help you understand the equation by looking at the uh, the screen right now so it relates to the returns on each security in relation to the index such as the KSE 100 index, the S&P 500 index, or the DGIA. But the equation will divide returns into two components. The equation will return you in a better way because a unique part will be alpha and a market-related part, beta. You'll be able to understand that these returns are going to be based on equation or correlation or referring to a benchmark. What is a benchmark? What, what is an index? Index is a benchmark of the performance of the market. An index will give you where the market is going. Is it positive or negative? And how is the index related to the economy? They normally think the index is a benchmark or a barometer of the, uh, the country's economy. And if the index is moving upwards, you're looking at positiveness and investor confidence in the economy and healthy, robust growth. On the other hand, if the index is falling, you look at it being reflective of the economy, health being bad. So if you were talking about the single index model, you'll be able to look at returns of each security to the returns of a common index. You can build up your index, but it would be a good idea to refer it to the already established identified indices, and then you can talk about returns of the portfolio or returns of individual strips in the portfolio in relationship to the index. So the index can be a benchmark in the single index model in which you can then evaluate what sort of performance has been happening with the portfolio or the stocks in the portfolio. So it would be a good idea to talk about single index models or maybe 
talk about referring because we talked and we talked about strategically managing the portfolio. I'd use the word strategic here more so like on war footing and trying to make the best returns possible. So in strategic management and then strategically managing the portfolios, we would understand that uh, we would be gauging the returns of the portfolio. We would be looking at the way we've uh, uh, made the, the decisions on the portfolio selection. And then if it's a single index model based model um, evaluation, we would then compare the returns um, with the models index values. The important thing is that you'll then be able to switch over from badly performing stocks more to better performing stocks. And then if I were to be making a single index model, I would have some sort of stocks in reserves as well. So they are continuously followed. And once you make a decision on switching over from one stock to another, you'd have a ready stock available with all the homeworks done instead of wasting time and trying to find out the, the matters with it. So we look at um, the, the equation and we found that B measures the sensitivity of a stock to the stock market's entire movement. In the equation, you could have seen that B would then be reflective of the measure of sensitivity. Plus, if securities are only related in their common response to the market, we're talking about correlation between index performance and your portfolio's performance. So in doing that, securities co-vary together only because of their common relationship to the market index. So these uh, will vary to uh, co-vary together in relationship with the general market index to which they are related. So security covariances depend only on market risk. Just take a quick look at the equation. Security covariances depend only on market risk and can be seen on your screen right now. This will help you look at the returns based on single model index. The single model index helps split a security's total risk. That is the advantage of the single model index because it will help out diversify or will split up the risk factor of a single stock. Also, total risk is equal to market risk plus unique risk. Unique risk will be the risk that you were talking about when we are splitting up a stock's uh, securities risk. So multi-index models could be another alternative than to the single index model. What would that be? A multi-index model would be between the full variance, covariance with method of Markowitz and the single index model. So these would be alternatives to the single index model and you could then use this as building up the portfolio or selecting the portfolio and looking at the best fit. So it could either be the single index model or it could be the multi-index models by looking at more than one indices as a way of looking at your return. If you're talking about return, we can talk about returns either on one benchmark, standardized benchmarks, international benchmarks, or benchmarks that have been created by yourself. So the index model method, whether it's the single index model method or the multi-index model method or the two index model method, you'll have to look at more benchmarks and then create a, a result on which you can claim what sort of results have been provided by the portfolio built up by you based on Markowitz selection models and your personal preferences. So sometimes uh, between the full variance uh, covariance method of Markowitz and the single index model, you can make a comparison between the two as well. Unless we are able to find out the best possible model, it's going to be very difficult to go away, do um, a good portfolio selection and give the poss best possible returns to the stakeholders. So portfolio selection is not anything to do with like dart both method in which you will take out strips in randomness. It's more towards you know, perfecting the best possible fit for a portfolio. Best portfolios will give you better results because um, the word best would maybe be replaced with optimal portfolios because we're talking about the best possible uh, portfolios. 
Now, since uh, assuming we have six to seven hundred companies in our market, we assume that the market capitalization of certain companies are is too big and the other is too small, it's going to be difficult to blend smaller capitalized and larger capitalized companies. So we were looking at the, uh, the single index model or the multi-index model, but selecting optimal asset classes is another expectations model that we have to look at. You have to look at different asset classes. We've talked about portfolios, we've talked about indices, we've talked about relating it to a single index, we've talked about relating it to two indices, we talked about relating it to multi-indices, but what we're now talking about is selecting optimal asset classes. i just given a quick reference to different asset classes. So another way to use, there are different ways you can use Markowitz model. You can use it for portfolio selection. You can use it for asset classification as well. So another way to use Markowitz model is with the asset classes. We can take a great deal of help from the Markowitz model of portfolio theories because it help you in various ways. Right now we're talking about using Markowitz model in selecting asset classes or uh, finding out which are the better asset classes. So there is an allocation of portfolio assets to broad asset categories. You give allocation to assets in the portfolio and find out which is the best possible uh, script to be put in into the portfolio. And doing that we look at asset class rather than individual securities. Okay. Here I need to tell you what an asset class is because we're talking about uh, the classification of, uh, uh, let's talk about it in industry terms. We're talking about an asset class, an asset class from a, um, a production industry or a financial uh, company or maybe an asset class which would be riskless, maybe bonds, maybe uh, shares. So you're going to talk about riskless assets or risky assets, financial assets or real assets. We're talking about different assets. So asset classes rather than individual security difference is most important for investors. We're talking about industries. We're talking about asset classes now. So different asset classes offer various returns and obviously various levels of risk. So correlation coefficients may be quite low, but we will understand that there are going to be bigger selection procedures for talking about asset classifications. In talking about asset classification, we are ruling out individual securities. Of course, those individual securities shall be following in that asset class. And then we can talk about the best possible of that asset class. So you could have what? Maybe an energy defined portfolio. Or maybe you could have a financial sector defined portfolio. You could have specific asset allocation. In asset allocation, decision about the proportion of portfolio assets allocated to the equity is important. You have to decide how much weightage are you giving to the particular asset class in the entire portfolio. Fixed income, money market, I just mentioned whether it's going to be riskless, risk free, risky, a fixed income, money market, foreign exchange, or stocks. It's going to be, it has to be determined what sort of uh, um, asset allocation or percentage are you going to be uh, giving to a particular class of assets. So the widely used application of modern portfolio theory we into the 21st century. So we are using the widely used application of modern portfolio theory, which actually didn't come into the 21st century, it came in the 20th century, but we use it more frequently. And because securities within a particular asset class tend to move together in groups. Asset allocation is an important investment decision. I had just mentioned about uh, the group movements of stocks in a particular industry. And they overshadowed the quality of the individual scripts. So we should look at international diversification also as part of uh, the asset allocation or real estate or US treasury bills or we have our own T bills. So it is important to diversify. We've talked a lot about uh, diversification, but what we needed to understand was asset diversification plus the diversification, risk diversification, product diversification, stock diversification. Um, we need to understand diversification of all sorts will help 
in managing our portfolio. Diversification may be of stocks. Diversification may be of um, based on capitalization. Diversification may be like we have just talked about on asset-based diversification. It can be on real assets. Or it can be on real estate. It can be on money market funds. It can be on stock markets. It can be on foreign exchange. The 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 range of products are increasing with the new financial engineering coming in. Now, if you're talking about uh, diversification based on the ratio or weightage of products in the portfolio, we need to understand which asset class will give you what return. In talking about balanced portfolios, we need to understand, we need to blend growth with value. We need to understand these uh, asset allocation classes that will help us on building up portfolios because these decisions will all have implications of portfolio selection because the implications of portfolio selection will then implication on, will have implication on the results as well. So for every, every action we have, there is a reaction. So everything that we decide on will give you a good return or a bad return. So there are impl what are the implications of portfolio selection? One would be to look at or focus on the risk that cannot be managed by diversification. Total risk is equal to systematic risk. And we talked about systematic risk being non-diversifiable. So total risk is systematic risk plus non-systematic risk. And once again, non-systematic risk is diversifiable risk. So investors should focus on risk that cannot be uh, managed by diversification. And we've just seen that total risk is equal to non-diversifiable risk and diversifiable risk. Another thing that has to be understood as an implication of portfolios is that there is systematic risk. And systematic risk is something that we can talk about in terms of variability in a securities total returns directly associated with economy-wide events macro impact. When talking about the EIC analysis, way back in one of the lectures, we talked about the EIC analysis, which was the economic industry company analysis. And we had to look at the bigger uh, um, things at hand than just micro focused on the portfolio or sub focused on the script. So common to virtually all securities is the economy wide risk, which is systematic risk. And Systematic risk can sometimes be a problem for the best uh, decisions that you've done because it's going to be affecting the entire economy and going to be affecting the entire uh, security market. So both risk components can vary over time. We're talking about non-systematic and systematic risk, diversifiable risk and non-diversifiable risk. So both risk components can vary over time. And this affects number of securities needed to diversify. We've got a big problem at hand. We're talking about the risk factors that we have no way of managing. What do we do in calamities? What do we do in natural disasters? What do we do in bigger events? And to look at that, we look at one way or the other, we looked at one of the similar graphs on your screens right now in lecture number 34 was about portfolio risk and diversification. We looked at the portfolio risk and we looked at the market risk. And if you look at the graph, you'll see that portfolio risk will tend to decrease with the number of uh, scripts increasing in the portfolio. While the portfolio risk will be more than a market risk, obviously it will also give you more returns as well. Now we're talking about market risk based on the index. We talked about the single index model and we talked that this could be then referred to or balanced to or um, you could take out results from how the portfolio is performing based on the market risk. Market risk have not been designed to work like that. Basically, what has happened is that you are able to look at the market as total because it's being represented by an index. 
And while we were talking about the index, we were able to relate performances of the portfolio in relationship to the index. Remember, we talked about the single index model, and we talked in the single index model because we had to look at what sort of a portfolio selection we are doing, and then we talked about uh, factors that would help us in deciding what sort of a good portfolio selection we are going to do. So if you were talking about looking at the systematic risk and non-systematic risk, we would look at the ways to evaluate the portfolio that we'd selected in relationship to the market risk or the market index. Now, the market index benchmark would be a good idea to look at if we were to understand what sort of results have been provided by our portfolio. So if we were to look at the market risk or the market index, we would understand, we would either look at the portfolio having performed poorly or badly, I'm sure, having used the Markowitz model, having used maybe the single index model or using your personal preferences after the initial decisions have been made on the type of portfolio, we'll surely be able to get a better result than the generalized market index. The market index is generally going to be depictive of the entire market. The entire market obviously tends to move together. We must understand that trends, trends tend to overcome individual stock performances and sometimes very good companies will probably not do as well if the market index is going down. And on the other hand, very average performing companies will probably move upward because we're looking at the market going upwards in totality and then maybe we have this herd behavior in the stocks and herd behavior in the investors and you look at all scripts moving in the same direction so this will depend on what sort of market movements are happening so maybe average you know, stock returns will give you better returns if you see a bullish market and good companies not performing as well if it's a bearish market, but a portfolio, a carefully selected portfolio using Markowitz model, using your personal preferences, and then deciding what the risk factors are involved, looking at the systematic risk, also looking at the non-systematic risk, also correlating your portfolio's performances with a single index model or with a multi-index model, we can look at the portfolio and then look at what sort of blend we have to. We did mention that we could talk about portfolios with value stocks or portfolios with growth stocks or a blend of worth or different asset classes like fixed income, like foreign exchange, real estate, T bills, derivatives, liquid stocks or illiquid cash. We could use all these asset classes to build up a really good optimal portfolio to give you optimal expected returns. Thank you very much.